Well, we have arrived at Act 4. We've crossed that line. We've come through Act 1 in creation and Act 2 when God began to build a people uh, for his name. And then in Act 3, he built a kingdom, uh, largely based on the requests of, of his children, wanting a kingdom. And then in Act 4, we now enter into dark days in the history of the people of Israel, the Hebrews. Uh, the consequences, there's always consequences of disobedience, right? Whether, whether it be our own children or grandchildren when they're three or five or nine or 13, actions have, have, make, make an effect. And sometimes the effect is, is beautiful and it's wonderful. And other times there's consequences. And so for generations, people have been turning their back on the God that rescued them out of Egypt, that delivered them into the promised land, that gave them fame, that gave them power, that gave them notoriety, that gave them wealth, that gave them incredible blessings. And they've kind of turned their back on him and turned towards other gods, thinking that they had power. Well, that ultimately led, when you walk away from God, you step out from under the umbrella of his blessing and favor. It's our choice to either remain in relationship with him or to step out from under that favor. And so now it's kind of fully manifest as the kingdom of Israel and Judah have divided and they've fallen. And now they've stepped into a, a fate similar to that uh, hundreds of years ago when they were enslaved in Egypt. They're now victims to the nations around them. They're at the mercy of whatever those kingdoms around them want to do. Now, during the time of Saul and David and Solomon, the unified nation of Israel was unrivaled. They were unchallenged. There was nothing on the outside, no one on the outside that could attack them or threaten them or challenge them. The only danger that existed, the only risk, was if on the inside of the nation of Israel there would be disintegration or division or distractions on the inside. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. God had warned his people through the prophets that if he gave them what they wanted, a king, a human king to follow, to be like all the other nations around them, over time they would see that that was an awful decision because it had the potential to, to, to sabotage the direction God wanted to lead the nation. But like little children that don't understand the damage that eating sugar every meal of every day can have on your teeth, these Israelite people wanted what they wanted no matter the cost. And so God, with a broken heart, answered their request. Now, after hundreds of years of kind of riding a, a moral, ethical, spiritual roller coaster based on whoever was living in the palace of Judah at the time, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah have fallen on the harshest seasons yet since they were first handed the keys by God to the promised land. 10,000 of their sharpest, the best and brightest young people are carried off into Babylon, marched right out of the city of Jerusalem, and nothing anyone wants to do about it can do anything about it. And this decision on the part of the Babylonians, on the part of King Nebuchadnezzar, it is incredibly strategic. He knows the best way to annihilate an entire group of people in one generation is to remove the best and brightest from everything that makes their environment predictable and comfortable, take them away into Babylon, brainwash them, indoctrinate them with a whole new culture, a whole new set of ethics, a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of living, and then once they've been transformed into the likeness of Babylon, send them back into their homeland no longer as a Jewish generation, but now as a Babylonian generation seeking the future expansion of Babylon. You know, in our, in our time period right now, we're in the midst of graduation, the graduation season. And so, you know, you probably maybe you've, have a family member, friend that's went through college graduation, or you might have, you know, some family members or your kids and high school graduation is coming up now. In fact, we have a, a Sunday set aside at the end of the month on graduation weekend where we like to honor them and hope that you've already... Um, shared that information with us so we can honor uh, the, the graduate, whether it be high school, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate, whatever it is, we want to celebrate that season with you and your family. But, but imagine in this season of graduation, high school, college grads, young people, if someone from a foreign invading county like Albany County came into Schoharie County and forcibly began to round up the best and brightest of our young people and was forcibly taking them far from here in order to change the way they think, change how they define right and wrong, change their values, change what you've tried to instill in them as your kids or grandkids. They want to change who they think God is 
or if God even exists. They, they want to change what you've tried to instill in them about work ethic or being a productive member of society. I mean, this is what King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. This is his end game. He wants to create automatronic robots that live for advancing the Babylonian dream and exist to kill the Hebrew dream. And this is why he starts with removing the best of the brightest and taking them back home to begin that process. But remember, Jeremiah, the prophet of God who was living, we talked about him last week. We read about him in chapter 17. He had delivered a message from God. He was the voice box of God. There were other false prophets communicating other messages, but Jeremiah was the lone voice of God in Jerusalem. And he was reminding people, he was speaking up saying that the Babylonians are not taking our young people away. God is sending them away. This is a fascinating thing to wrap our minds around. I mean, imagine being there as a parent, a grandparent, watching you know, your future be marched out in front of you and you can do nothing to stop it. And, and then the prophet Jeremiah is telling you that that was not the Babylonian authority that did that. That was our God sending them away. I mean, this would be hard words to really swallow. Sending my kid into exile? I don't know if I'll ever see them again alive. See, this is a great reminder for us in our day that God never wastes our pain. He never wastes our pain. In this day, this was the consequence of generations of, of, of walking away from God, dishonoring God, disobeying God. This was the consequence. But even though there was a consequence to their actions, God was still using their pain for his purpose. Whatever traumatic or difficult struggle you faced in life, God can use it for good if you'll let him do it. There, there may be a period of healing that God wants to lead, in, lead you through, and make no mistake about it, theologically, God does not cause all the pains in our lives. Sometimes we cause them ourselves. Sometimes there's other people in our lives that we don't control that, that, that impact us in such a way that it causes pain or hurt. Then there's other things God does allow that, that hurt us or wound us. But that pain can have a purpose and a benefit for other people if we'll let God lead us on the path of healing. So in looking at the world at this time, the time of the Babylonian exile, God has an opportunity an opportunity to take the consequences for the nation of Israel and to send the best and brightest far to Babylon to convey the good news about the one true God of Israel. And so he does that. He sends names that you might be familiar with. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were their Hebrew names, but as a part of that indoctrination strategy, when they arrive in Babylon, their names are changed. Their Babylonian names that they're given are Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, as Daniel's life begins to play out, he's a witness to some unbelievable miracles. Unbelievable miracles. And if for any reason, maybe, maybe uh, early on in January or February, you picked up that book, The Story, that, that we've been recommending, where it kind of takes the 31 major epic narratives of God and puts them in a... In a um, chronological order so you can read history as it's unfolded and how God has interacted with history. Maybe you kind of came apart, you started strong and maybe along the way you kind of faded or there were so many names and kings and kingdoms and all of that, you got lost in the weeds. I want to encourage you to pick it back up this week and just turn right to chapter 18. You don't have to recap, you don't have to play catch up, just start fresh. Chapter 18, no guilt, no shame. You know, this, since January, we've, we've had 200 books get picked up at guest services. We've never had that kind of response before within our church. We've never purchased 200 books and all of them be gone. We literally have none left. And so we're ordering more. But I want to encourage you, if that book's laying around somewhere, pick it up, dive into chapter 18 this week because it's compelling. Daniel's life and those around him in this exile, they have compelling stories to tell. Basically, there's a few big moments captured in the 12 chapters of his life as told in scripture. And know this, if you don't have the story and you want to dive into the book of Daniel, that's great, read the Bible. But Daniel's book in the 12 chapters is not told chronologically. It jumps around a bit in different periods and ages of his life. So the one neat thing about the story is it takes it, puts it in his life in chronological order. But chapters one through four do kind of play out in, chrono in chronology uh, as he's between the ages of 15 and 60 years old. This is that point in Daniel's life. Now that's quite a wide swath of years, but one of the things we see early on is when Daniel's a teenager and he first arrives into Babylon, Daniel's a rebel. He's a rebel. He doesn't just do what's told of him. And so maybe you kind of connect with that. You're like, yeah, I'm kind of a rebel too. I don't like to do what people tell me to do. Well, I want you to go and read that story because his captors are telling him to do something and he's kind of resisting that. And he's pretty outspoken about that resistance. It's a pretty 
pretty awesome kind of challenging confrontation that he has and how God shows up in that. Later on, you see Daniel be invited to interpret a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. And it's a pretty powerful story as well because all the king's counselors, he has the, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, he doesn't know what to do with it. And so nobody has the courage to try to guess at what it means, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Daniel has the answer. He has the direction. And of course, that immediately gets the king's attention. Now all of a sudden, Daniel's on his radar. Who is this guy that has this uncanny ability to do something no one else can do? Then you get into the, the later part of that early season of Daniel's life, and you, you read this incredible narrative about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where, where they're told what to do. They need to bow before an idol, and they say, we only bow to the one true God. And this is a life or death consequence. And so the consequence is anybody that doesn't bow to this idol representing King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be thrown into a giant furnace that's heated seven times hotter than normal. And a miracle happens in that story. You need to read that. It's one of the, one of the most significant, um, powerful uh, miracles in the Old Testament. But then we move into chapter 5. Chapter 5 on in, Daniel, in the book of Daniel is the later part of his life. And we begin to read that um, as, as the Babylonian exiles moved on now into decades, Daniel has consistently rose in the ranks of leadership and authority within the foreign nation of Babylon. He's in a very high position. And, and God even gives him prophecies about the coming Messiah that would happen uh, five, six hundred years before it happens. But also something else would happen that Jeremiah the prophet, generation before Daniel, even though they were alive in, at the same time, Jeremiah had said that um, uh, for 70 years Babylon will rule, but then God is going to give them into the hands of another nation. Daniel's there when it happens. All of a sudden in comes riding King Cyrus and Persia. The Persians from the east ride in. And, and they're so impressed with Daniel serving in Babylon, they immediately give him authority and leadership in Persia as well. So this is the, the specific season of Daniel's life that I want us to spend a little bit of time on today. And this is a part of Daniel's story that for me reminds me of being a kid in Sunday school with a little blue-haired lady in a flannel graph in the classroom. Uh, and flannel graphs, it was like flannel, and then there were like these little cartoons that would move around and would illustrate the story. And, and when I was a kid growing up, and if you don't know what a flannel graph is, I feel like your childhood is robbed from you. It was amazing. Flannel graph was great before you could have a, you never even think to have a TV screen in a Sunday school classroom. But most of the Bible narratives that were often told to me when I was a kid often involved animals. And, and I think it's probably just because kids like animals, right? They like zoos and circuses and, and, and maybe I'm still a kid. I like zoos and circuses too. But what I remember clearly thinking as I began to get older is that most of the stories Many of the stories, especially in the Old Testament, that involve animals, when you really look at them closely, they're terrifying. Like, they're terrifying stories. And one of the most common is Noah and the Ark. And, and we immediately think, like, some entire children's ministries are called Noah's Ark, you know, and, ba and daycares are called Noah's Ark. And I remember in the, the, the Sunday school classroom, concrete walls, that, that I first said yes in faith to Jesus. I said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I remember being six or seven, and that little blue-haired lady was, was there leading me to Jesus. And, and I remember on the wall, I remember seeing it, because it was there for years, this incredible mural of Noah's Ark. And whoever did it did an amazing job. But you had the sea, and you had Noah's boat. And of course, you know, it was almost like it had to be in every like graphic depiction of Noah's Ark. There was a window with the giraffe's head sticking out, right? Just so there was room. Like that has to be, I think, in every, like legally, it has to be in every picture. But then you saw Noah and his family up on the deck, and, and you saw the dove and the olive branch, and there were sea creatures underneath the boat. And I remember as I got older, and I'd, I'd go back into that classroom as my brothers and sisters were there, and I really understood the story. I was like, you know what? There should be people floating in the water trying to get on. Like, there should be people drowning. Like, the emphasis of that story is the annihilation of, of wickedness and sinfulness at, at the state of humanity. Like, that's a core element of the story is that, that God will not compromise himself when it comes to sin. That no matter how permissive our culture is when it comes to sin, our God is a God of justice. There's right and there's wrong. And there's consequences for what's wrong. I also remember the same thing about one of the other popular narratives with animals in the Bible where we have an obedient, sacrificial, humble man now in his early 80s that is thrown into a den of hungry lions to be eaten alive as punishment. And that's Daniel. I remember some of the images or cartoons that I would, that I would see that were used back when I was a kid to illustrate the lions. And they just kind of seemed silly to me because it didn't seem that threatening. It didn't seem, kind of seemed like a pretty cool experience, like swimming with dolphins. 
because they would downplay often in these graphics how terrifying that moment must have been in that circumstance for Daniel. One, one image I still remember was this idea. It was, it was biblically inaccurate because it normally, oftentimes in kids' ministry, it would show a young Daniel, and we know he's in his early 80s at this point, but, but he's reclining on the lions almost as if they're a comfy mattress. Like, this is just a pleasurable day, like a nice relaxing day off from work as a leader in Persia or something. There was another one um, that's actually on the cover of a, a kid's book where the, the, they're kind of like licking his hands, like they're, they're cozy little house cats. I mean, house cats are evil, so this doesn't resemble cats at all. Um, here's one where I found Daniel standing kind of like proper and regal, like he's in Shakespeare or something, you know? <laughs> Like he's the lion whisperer or something, you know, like no fear, just complete control. Uh, and then there's another one which is not included. I guess I missed it when I put my slides together. But I don't know that those are really reality. There, there's one, um, and I'll post it on our Facebook page later today. But there's one that I think might be a little more realistic as you have kind of a man in his early 80s that's, that looks like he's in his early 80s, doesn't look like Santa Claus, kind of frail on the ground with his hands crossed and with a little bit of terror on his face, not knowing how this is going to play out with a majestic male lion behind him that sees a meal. His mouth is open and just the power and the, the size differential between a man in his 80s and a lion. Many times in his life, Daniel chose obedience to God and was unwilling to compromise his worship. He chose over and over and over again to stand firm in his faith, not knowing in those days what exactly the cost of being faithful might bring. In the days when he was rebellious, when he was a teenager, first brought into Babylon, he didn't know exactly what could happen by resisting. But this time, he knew exactly what obedience to God might cost him, a den of lions. So the question then is, well, what did an 80-year-old man do to deserve such a punishment? What threat does Daniel, in the twilight of his life, what does he pose to the mighty Persian empire who has enough power to overcome or overthrow even the Babylonians. Well, let me give you kind of a portrait of, of just the size and scope of Persia at this moment in human history because it's massive. There, there's a map up here that kind of gives you an idea of the Persian Empire at the kind time of David, all the way from the Mediterranean Sea across Asia. I mean, it's, it's just a massive amount of geography that the Persians occupy and control. Now, you may say that and say, okay, great, that's a map. I don't live there. I don't know where what is what. To the left and the west, you have the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> to the south, the Mediterranean Sea, there in the yellow is Egypt, and then Israel would be up on that little eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, but you can see it stretch across the Middle East, up into to parts of Europe, and then across to Asia. Let's go back in time. We've went through a lot of narratives in our, in our journey since the, book, since the month of February in the book of Exodus. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's give a little comparison, okay? Now we're zooming in on the southern tier of the Mediterranean Sea. This is the ancient Egyptian um, empire, which was in power for hundreds of years. <coughs> there was no one that challenged them for hundreds of years. Now, the Assyrians existed up to the north and, and, and to, the, to the east, but ancient Egypt was so powerful, and that was the time of Moses, where God sends Moses in, let my people go, they're rescued out of slavery, and they're sent into the land of Canaan. So let's jump to, to forward a few decades to the land of Canaan. Now that's the region of Canaan. They leave Egypt, they go into the land of Canaan and God gives them the, the keys to the promised land, the land of Canaan, where Abraham first settled and where Joseph and his family was till Joseph was taken away into Egypt and then he brought his family there to rescue them from famine. Now God is bringing them back to Canaan. And so let's jump ahead to the time then after Joshua to the time of David. Now here's where the United Kingdom is at its strongest. David and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel, the United Kingdom, this is the scope of influence and authority that, 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 um, that Israel had. You can kind of see it. It's large in comparison to what was there when Egypt was there. It kind of keeps getting bigger and bigger. But you'll see Assyria is there off to the east, and even Persia. Go ahead and go back for me one time, Will. In that, you can kind of see Mesopotamia and Assyria up there uh, to, the, to, the, to the east, and then even Persia is there just on the, the outer edge of the picture. And, and after... Um, the kingdom of Israel divides. The northern kingdom of Israel is first overwhelmed by the Assyrians. And so now you'll see, as we zoom out again, the Assyrian Empire, wow, it's pretty big. 
And, and you can kind of see the remnant, if you can see it without glasses, I don't know, Jerusalem is right there on kind of that south, southeastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Jerusalem is kind of a, a, a stronghold <coughs> where Judah, the, the region of Judah, is still kind of autonomous and not completely overwhelmed until Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar arrive in 600 BC. Now you can see the Babylonian oversight. Go ahead and go to the next one. So now that purple right there, that's how much Babylon controls. You still got Egypt, and you've got the Median Empire, and you see Persia out there to the east by the Persian Gulf. But you see, Babylon is now the world power. Now we jump ahead from that time into the time of Daniel, and we're back at this picture again. Now you can see the scope of Persia's influence, the scope of, of how much geography and taxation Persia has in authority. Now, I want to hold that right, right there on that slide. I want to jump ahead to, for you for a second to see where we're going. How does this change in the days ahead? You know, we only have three weeks left in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll work our way through 19, 20, and 21 over the next three weeks and wrap this up the end of June. And then in July and August, we're actually going to we're going to jump back into parts of the Old Testament, and we're going to touch on stories we skipped, stories that, for, for a number of reasons, that are still a part of the mega narrative of God, um, but we skipped over them in these first 21 weeks to stay with the chapters. We're going to take a little bit of a break and revisit some things over the summer, and then starting at Family Fun Weekend in September down at the fairgrounds, we'll relaunch into the New Testament with the arrival of Jesus. So I want to touch on what happens after the period of the Old Testament, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is Persia still in control? Well, no, they're not. A new nation has risen up, one that probably many of you are familiar with, and that's the time of Alexander the Great. Go back one to the Greek Empire. So this is now that you can see the scope of the Greek Empire now reaching, overwhelming the Persians and controlling the majority of the world. Now this is the period of time between the Old and New Testament, but then a couple of hundred years before Jesus would arrive, the Romans rise. And, and if you go to about 100 AD, the days of the early church, now you can see the Mediterranean is completely surrounded on all sides by the Roman Empire's reach. So if you like history, great. If not, you can wake up now. We're moving on. But um, let's go back. So that just kind of gives you an idea of where we're heading. At the time of Jesus in the early church, Rome is the ruling class of people, and the Jews are, are deeply oppressed under the Roman rule. So let's go back to the time of Daniel and the, and the time of Persia. The king of Persia, when David is an old man in his 80s, King Darius, he, he's very strategic and he's taken all of this land in orange and he's broken it down into 120 states or 120 provinces. And over each province, he's appointed a royal ruler that rules in his place under his leadership. And then above all 120 of those rulers, he's identified three that serve as kind of his executive cabinet coordinating all 120 provinces. And so if you were considered one of those three, you, you had power second only to King Darius. Well, one of those three was Daniel, the Hebrew exile that rose to prominence in Babylon and now is, is, is a major player in Persia. And he's in his 80s. Now it is undeniable at this point in history, Daniel is the most effective and efficient leader of all those in Persia and everybody around him knows it. They know it. I mean, this is the star of the team. This is the guy that when the clock's at 40 seconds, feed him the ball, he'll put it in the net. He scores every time he touches it. And King Darius knows it. And King Darius likes Daniel. And he grows to fall. He literally loves Daniel. He's so, it, it's, if you've ever played on a team with a star player, you're like, man, I'm so glad this guy's on the team. Like, that's where Darius is at. Everything that he touches, Daniel turns to gold. And so King Darius is considering, considering elevating him to be second in command over the whole Persian Empire. The problem is Daniel's colleagues know this is in the mind of Darius, that he's moving in this direction for the Persian Empire. And they're upset about that because they want to be second in command. They're eager. It's, it's amazing. Daniel is humble. He doesn't have an ego. He doesn't seek out these positions. God elevates him to them. Meanwhile, he's surrounded by contemporaries that keep trying to get their name in the hat, to get more power, to get more authority for their legacy. And so they begin to think, all right, if we can't, surpass Daniel, then we have to take him out. If you can't beat him, take him out. They wanted that title for themselves. And so in Daniel 6, we read this. Daniel did a better job than the other two leaders or any of the royal rulers. I love this statement. He was an unusually good and able man. It's good to be unusual. 
So the king planned to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. But the other two leaders and the royal rulers heard about it. So they looked for a reason to bring charges against Daniel, trying to manipulate the situation to remove him so they can do it. They tried to find something wrong with the way he ran the government, but they weren't able to. They couldn't find any fault with his work. He could always be trusted. He never did anything wrong. It's frustrating when somebody never does anything wrong. And he always did what he was supposed to. Why do people do what they're supposed to? Finally, these men say, we want to bring charges against this man, Daniel. We want to take out the competition. But it's almost impossible for us to come up with a reason to do it. If we can find a reason, it will have to be in connection with the law of his God. This is interesting. What they're saying is, we've examined this guy closely. He is loyal to Persia. He's loyal to King Darius. He does what's expected of him. He meets every test. But there's one thing he has greater loyalty to than Persia, and that is the God of Israel. That is the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. And so if, if we're going to find anything wrong, They figure their only hope, if they can't find him doing something already illegal, they have to look at what he's doing in relationship to his faith, change the law, make that illegal, knowing that he will not compromise, he'll keep doing it, and then they can get him. And so you can read this for yourself in chapter 18 this week, and I encourage you to, because I'm just going to summarize it. But in Daniel 6, these two schemers go before King Darius, and they begin to butter him up. They're brown nosers. They're trying to manipulate him. They puff him up. And so they, they kind of come into the palace and they're like, hey, King Darius, how you doing? Man, man, you're looking good. You lost some weight? Like, you look good. Like, do you have a trainer or something? Like, are you on keto diet or what, what are you doing? Like, did you do P90X? Because, man, you're jacked. Like, look at, look at, look at your calves. I mean, look at those biceps. You're, you're chiseled, King. And are those new sandals? Like, they look like they were made for your foot. Like, that's and I got to say, the gowns you've been wearing and the colors, like they're setting the trends for the spring, man. You got it all going on. You are rocking it. So these two guys start buttering him up. And they convince him that he's awesome, that he's great, that he's amazing, that he's a god. And then they even go, they say, you know what? No one should even want to communicate or ask any other god for anything because you rise among all of them. You, you are the king of Persia. You are the, the, the world power. In fact, you should sign an edict that, that just emphasizes who you are and how great you are that nobody for a month is allowed to pray to anybody else but King Darius because he's the best. He's amazing. And that's always a great strategy if you're wondering. If people don't love you, then force them under punishment of death to love you. It's a great plan. Because he says, they they say, you, you should just say, if anybody chooses to pray to anybody else, the consequence is being fed to my lions. I'll show you who's in charge. That's one way to win the hearts of the people, right? No, it's a terrible idea. But he signs the law. He's consumed with his own glory. And what's interesting is in the ancient world, especially at the time of Persia, once an order was signed by the king, not even the king could undo it. It had to be carried out. Even if he changed his mind, it had to be enforced. Which is interesting to me. You're a God. You're the most powerful in the world. But if you sign this, not even you can change it. I don't understand how that works, but that was the context. What we soon discover is King Darius realizes he's been manipulated. And he loves Daniel, but Daniel's the center of the target for these two guys. I mean, he loves Daniel because if you have a highly skilled starting point guard that scores every time they touch the ball, you want him on your team. You don't want him getting injured. And everything Daniel seems to touch turns to gold. It just works. Not only that, but Daniel, it's not about his ego. He's got the right attitude. He's got the right spirit. He's a team player. He does what's asked of him. He excels. He's got character and integrity. He's trustworthy. He does what he says he's going to do, a man of his word. And that's one of the reasons why the king wants to promote Daniel to be second in command over everything. Because he believes the whole kingdom, the whole empire will run better when Daniel has control of it. And this moment quickly deteriorates into the largest test of Daniel's faith in his life. Because what looks like it's building towards a promotion on the outside is becoming a a moment of temptation or opposition on the inside. See, sometimes when God begins to bless someone with favor... Because we're all sinful, broken, 
self-centered human beings, jealousy can begin to grip our heart. We can become envious, even to the point of where we want to tear that person down or we want to, we want to attack them. I mean, maybe you've received a promotion before and the people that you thought would be most supportive of that blessing in your life that you'd been working towards were the most critical of you that day. And you were like, whoa, I, I didn't expect this. I thought they'd be happy for me, but you were surprised, maybe even discouraged. Maybe some of you here, you're excited about your new walk in faith with Christ. You're excited maybe about the, the home church that you found here at Fusion and Maybe you're falling in love with the very people that you sit with each week or that you hang out with out in the foyer every Sunday you come and this is your church home now and, and you're just excited about the future and you're participating in the ministry here and you're serving and you're giving of yourself and your kids are loving it and your life is changing. But, but when you leave here and go back into your world, there's people that were in your circle before. But they're kind of they're ostracizing you. Maybe they're condemning you. Maybe they're teasing you and it hurts. Maybe there's some here you're feeling a strong conviction from God to, to make a significant change in your life that will require much more discipline. And you know it will honor God, but if you're honest, you're wrestling with taking that step because you know it's going to be unpopular. There's going to be people around you in our culture, friends of yours, that aren't on the same faith journey yet that you are. And they're going to have critical things to say about it. And you know that. Because it may be popular when we gather for worship to talk about these things, but it may be unpopular in our culture to live them out. Maybe you're in the considerations of downsizing your home and getting serious about paying off debt, removing things, the payments and all of that, because you really, you really feel God speaking to you about addressing that. Maybe you're in a dating relationship right now, uh, but you're not moving in together and you're not sleeping together even though the people around you are, are looking at you cross-eyed like, well, what are you doing? This is just normal in our culture. And you're saying, no, I want to honor God in every area of my life. Maybe you're going to lower the hours that you work. You're going to lower your income because you want to volunteer more in an area that you're passionate about, that you want to give yourself to because you know that's more significant than any amount of money. Maybe you're going to reduce your standard of living, your income, so that you can increase your standard of giving generously, financially. Maybe you've committed to attend worship gatherings every week, to be in this room every Sunday to worship God together with your family of God and, and to experience the presence of God and hear his voice speak to you. And, and in, in choosing to do that, it's changed your social circle and it's changed your calendar in ways that have impacted relationships and you're feeling pressure from people who don't understand why you would do this. People you thought were friends, but now you're wondering. See, whenever God stirs your heart for a step of faith, whenever you take that step, God's favor and blessing will reveal itself and, and our lives will change and transform as we're obedient to God because there's fruits of obedience that come. But the enemy of God is not happy about it. Jesus himself identifies that there is a spiritual adversary and his name is Satan. And he wants to oppose you and he will raise up others that he has influence over to attack you, to be hostile towards you, and to attempt to tear you down. That's where Daniel's at. Daniel had lived a life of obedience to God. He was humble. He was a hard worker. He was focused and disciplined in his life and in his faith. He was blessed with an increase in favor by God. Meanwhile, those on the outside saw that favor. They couldn't explain it away. And they grew jealous of what they saw. But let's also be honest. Let's not just talk about the surface. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the condition of our hearts because jealousy is not just something we see out there in the way that other people treat us, but oftentimes there's a temptation we all need to confess that, we're, that we sometimes lean towards envy or jealousy ourselves. How have you reacted in different seasons of your life, maybe even recently, when you see someone you know that's received a blessing where your motive's pure and joyful and celebration for them? Or was your heart jealous? When your brother or sister's family got the new car, how did your heart react? When the neighbors are renovating their house, meanwhile yours just gets older and older, how did your heart react? When your son or daughter sits on the bench while someone else's son or daughter continues to get more playing time, how did your heart react? When the person in the other bed in the hospital room was only there for a day or two and then they went home, with medication and all things are good, but you're back again in that bed for the third or fourth or fifth time this year and they don't know what's going on. When you attend another wedding 
wondering when it will be your turn to walk down the aisle. How does your heart react? When you see someone else that can do something better than you, but you don't know how much they've worked behind the scenes to get there, does jealousy begin to creep in, wishing you could do it like them? I mean, we all want to experience the favor of God. We long for, for like the divine blessing from our Savior. We pray for it, but we're quick to look past how we can become just like one of those two jealous colleagues of Daniel. We could grow bitter. We could become jealous and envious. And we can fall in the temptation to want to manipulate circumstances to benefit us and make the other person suffer. So King Darius signs the law into place. It cannot be changed. It's official. And Daniel, being in the know, has a decision to make. He'll either continue to nurture his relationship with God the way he always has, and continue to pray to the one true God, or out of fear he'll give in to the new law and stop pursuing his Savior. The way I see it, Daniel has three options. The first is be safe. Be safe. You know, and, and, and justify in your mind, you know, God, I've been praying to you. I'm over 80 now, and I've been praying to you for a long time. Every day I pray to you, and we've got this great relationship. I trust you. You've blessed me. It's all good. And, and now with this law, you know, you've allowed Darius to come in. You've allowed the Persians to come in. You, you allow them to be an authority, and I know what your word says, that you allow those in authority over us. We're to submit to them. And so I'm just going to take 30 days off from praying. I'm not going to pray to you. I'm not going to pray to Darius, but, but I'm not going to engage with you either, God. I'm just going to, I'm going to take a break. And, and for us in our context, text today, we could kind of flirt with this idea too. You know what, God, it's been a busy season. Summer's on us. And you know what? We just need to recalibrate. We need to fill the tank. And so we just need to, we, we want to go play on the lake. And we want to play in the woods and, and we want to travel and we want to do this. We want to sleep in on Sundays and or whatever. And, and God, you know, just for July and August, you're not going to see us around at Fusion. We'll, we'll be back in the fall, but we're going to take a break. We need some time off. Daniel had that choice, take a break, but he didn't. He believed that discipline, focus, and obedience and consistency were more important than convenience. The second opportunity he had was to pray silently, to be careful. By pray secretly and silently, change his disciplines. And if I'm honest with you, just being completely honest, I have never faced the kind of threat on Daniel. And, and I could say all day long, I, I hope that I would just keep praying as I've always prayed. But I think I know myself well enough to say, you know, it'd be tempting to just close the drapes, pray behind closed doors. That if my life was at risk of being thrown into a lion's den, just being honest with you, I, I, would, I would battle that temptation to just pray secretly and silently. I mean, most of the time I don't pray out loud anyways when I'm alone. I pray in, in, in silently in my head or, or, or in my heart with God and, and when I'm driving and in the morning or in the evening. Daniel could have done this. He could have just been inconspicuous and continued to pray to God without risk of being exposed. But I love what he shows us. He chooses the third one, to be obedient. Keep pursuing the one true God like he always has, to let the world see his faith and to trust the outcomes in the hands of God, who is the ultimate authority, not King Darius and not these two knuckleheads trying to take him out. He's putting his faith in God with his very life. When you're doing something to honor God for the glory of God, there will always be opposition because the world we live in is in spiritual conflict. The victory's already been won. The freedom's already been given. Death has already been overwhelmed. But we are still in the middle of this broken world that's in the process of redemption until Christ returns. And then it's done Daniel chooses to stand out. He chooses to stand up. He chooses to stand firm, even in the midst of his enemies, in the midst of resistance or opposition, that some of you might even be able to identify that you're going through now. Daniel shows us a lesson here, a lesson about courage. We will never find courage from backing down or hiding. We'll only discover courage when we stand up for what God calls us to stand for. If we stand firm in obedience to honor him, God will show us who he is and what he can do. I love verse 10 of chapter 6. It tells us how Daniel responds. Daniel found out that the king had signed the order. In spite of that, he did just as he had always done before. He went home, 
to his upstairs room. Its windows opened towards Jerusalem. You see his heart for his home, his heart for his people. He went to his room three times a day to pray. Not in the middle of the night when everyone was sleeping. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he gave thanks to his God. He raised a hallelujah in the presence of his enemies. Love it. One of the lessons we take away from this is the fact that you cannot find the courage to stand until you kneel to pray. Kneeling to pray is what fosters within us the courage to stand, to recognize where we sit in relationship to God. Daniel discovered he could stand in the presence of temptation. He could stand in the presence of men he couldn't trust only because he first had discovered how to kneel in the presence of a God he could trust with everything. And so he knelt down. He changed his physical posture when he would begin to pray, physically submitting to God as a symbol of his spiritual condition. And I believe that it's hard for us to submit to God's plan every single time and still be in our comfort zone, still be comfortable and convenient. Sometimes we need to change our posture physically. We need to learn to get on our knees with a heart of surrender, to get a little uncomfortable on a hard floor, and to take a position that maybe isn't one we take often as a symbol of a, of a submissive heart. After all, it was our Savior who, ent- who left the comfort of heaven to come to an uncomfortably dark world and allow himself to uncomfortably be nailed to a tree for us. So right now I'm going to close the message. No more thoughts, no more challenges. But in about a minute, I'm going to invite you with me to just maybe turn around and kneel at your seat. And that's how we're going to close the message today. We're going to kind of echo the posture of Daniel. And we're going to kneel before God and we're going to feel that, that, that uncomfortable feeling. And I want to ask you to do this if you're physically able. Don't do it if you're not able to get back up. We don't want to make a 911 call to, to get you assistance. But, but I want to encourage you to think about changing your posture outside of this place, but even at home. How could you change your posture at home, at work? What, what might God be opening your mind to think about? Changing your physical posture to show the condition of your heart that we need him that we're desperate for him. Now, I want to say this. If you're a guest with us today, your first time here at Fusion, and you're just like, yep, I knew I shouldn't have come. These people are weird. Now i got to kneel at my chair. Please understand, we don't do this every week. But it fits the message today. And, and if anything, I don't know where you sit with faith in Christ, but I would love to have the opportunity to pray over you. And my assumption would be, no matter what, what, where you're at and what season of life, if you're a guest with us here today, there's something in your life that's bigger than what you're able to control. That's true for all of us. And it might be something that's exciting, but it's bigger than you can control. It might be something that's breaking your heart and it's bigger than you can control. As you kneel, you're just kind of saying, God, help me with that. I would love to pray for you in that. Sometimes we need to get on our knees with a heart of surrender as a symbol. And if you've never knelt before God in prayer today, that posture is a model of humility. To kneel before God is, is a, a posture of surrender. I mean, even when you kneel down, it's, it's a position of vulnerability. You know, if, if you're in a, in, a, in a face-to-face confrontation or fight, kneeling down is a bad idea because you're vulnerable now. And so if you feel like you're in a fight in some area of your life, kneeling doesn't make a lot of sense until you recognize you're kneeling before the one who has ultimate authority. When you kneel down, it's a sense of reverence for the one who's holy and set apart. Kneeling carries with it this idea of humility. I know who I am, God, and I know who you are. And kneeling down also carries with it this image of dependence, that I can't do this on my own. And there's even times where kneeling, for me, for you, it isn't even enough, but we need to kind of bury our face in the ground and just lay flat out, prostrate before the Lord. Complete submission getting low because our God is so high above us and just to call on him and just to listen to him and depend on him and hear from him and let me add this if if you're a Jesus follower today you need to understand you are living in the lion's den right now in 2019 in the United States of America the lions may not be real big yet they may not be real hungry yet but we are living at a time in history where it's getting more and more towards Christians 
that our, our, our battle daily is often one, you know, we live in a world that kind of preaches an ethic of tolerance, which tolerance basically means everybody's right. Let everybody be right. And, and we serve a God who is very clear. He is the only way to the Lord. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only hope is the name of Jesus. No one makes it to the Father except through him. So, so we have a faith that is exclusive. But the beauty of Jesus is he is the most inclusively exclusive in the world because everybody's welcome at the table. Everybody. Doesn't matter the color of your skin, your age, your experiences, your failures, your sins. Doesn't matter. Everybody's welcome. And Jesus modeled that. He reached the least, the, 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 those that were most ostracized. He gave the bulk of his priority and attention and his love to. But he was also clear that there is only one path of redemption. And so we live in a world that is growing increasingly confrontational with the claim of Christianity. But the good news is that our protection in a dark, broken world does not come from our abilities, doesn't come from our talents, it doesn't come from us. Our, our protection doesn't come from stockpiling ammunition in the basement. Our protection doesn't even come from the freedoms that we have in this nation that could be taken away in an instant. But our refuge, our deliverance, our protection comes from the name of Jesus Christ and the victory at the cross and his Holy Spirit. And so even though we live in, in the beginnings of a lion's den in 2019, it's becoming more and more hostile towards Christianity, we will only find consistent courage like Daniel in his hostile culture as we find ourselves consistently kneeling on our knees before the God of the universe. So I wanna invite you to join me if you want to. Just spin around in the seat that you're in, kneel down and I'm gonna pray for you. If you can't, that's okay, just bow your head. Father God, We thank you that we have this opportunity, no matter where we are, no matter the circumstances of our lives, to be in your presence. That because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you have given us your Holy Spirit. That for all those who believe, your Holy Spirit now inhabits us. We are your temple. A temple made of flesh and blood. A temple that's not perfect, but it houses the perfect one and the power of the Holy Spirit that with you, God, everything is possible. There is nothing impossible with you. And so we change our posture here this morning, Lord. We kneel before you. Even as our knees get a little uncomfortable as they're on the concrete, as we're slouched over a chair and, and it's, it's an unfamiliar position, we come before you with great reverence, with vulnerability, with dependence, God. We need you. Every hour we need you. And we praise you today, God, in, in the midst of whatever season of life each of us are in, whether we're on a mountain peak celebrating what you're doing or whether we're in a difficult, dark day in our lives, like those the Israelites were in in the days of King Darius, like Daniel was in in the lion's den. Wherever we are, God, we want to praise you. We want to worship you. But God, we also want to ask you to help us to have courage. I believe that every single person that's here, Lord, you have a next step of faith, belief, you're calling us to take, to trust you more in today than we did yesterday. I pray, God, you would give us courage to take that step with wild abandon, trusting only in the name of Jesus, not in ourselves, not in our ability to control the outcome, not in our own wealth, our own intellect, not in our own financial security, but that we would trust you completely, God, the step you're calling us to take. Make that abundantly clear. And in all this, God, we thank you for your love on display for us on the cross of Jesus Christ. And while we were sinners separated, you made a way when there was no way. We thank you for that gift, God. And we worship you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, if you're wondering how Daniel's story ended, I will point you to chapter 18 of the story or Daniel chapter 6 to go and read it on your own. But it's a miracle. Some of you um, may have never read 
or, or uncovered Daniel's story, and I hope that there's a, an inkling within you to say, you know what, I wanna find out how this comes to a close.